today's live stream is brought to you by subterranean humans. Do they exist? Have they existed? Is Agartha real? Are there advanced civilizations in the earth? If people do live in the earth, are they like decrepit, pale, Thalmor creatures? What the Thalmor are to the elves? How much of the video game The Forest is inspired by real events? These are really good questions. These are really important questions. Uh, but this live stream is sponsored by them. Someone under the name Anti, as in like the relative, Anti-Hate, <laughs> says, keep missing the streams, take my money. Hey, thank you for that donation, Anti-Hate. If anyone else wants to donate at any time, you can by looking at the links, look at the dono chat. I've created a list of legally justifiable actions that I could take against the executive director of Khan, Evan Balgord. So I'm really hoping that he doesn't force my hand here. If Evan Balgord were to ever jump out at me from behind the bushes and throw a punch, I would definitely engage in close quarters combat. So I hope that he doesn't do that because I don't want to go there. And you know, I was thinking if I were in the mountains and I were to hear some loose rocks above me because Evan Balgord is attempting to push boulders on me, I'll make sure that I evade the danger and confront the threat, the threat which would be Evan Balgord. Or if I were swimming in a pool and Evan Balgord tries to grab my foot because he's in a scuba suit underneath me trying to drown me, I'll engage in underwater combat. Or if I'm hiking and downwind, Evan Balgord, I catch his scent and he's attempting to stalk and ambush me. I'll utilize my surroundings. I'll conquer him physically and mentally. If I'm on a bicycle and Evan Balgord attempts to throw a stick in my wheel spokes to cause me grievous bodily harm, I will defend myself. I'll perform a citizen's arrest. And if I'm at a bar and Evan Balgord attempts to spike my drink in an effort to molest my unconscious body, I will, I will protect myself by any means necessary. If I'm at the barber and the regular barber goes into the back room and Evan Balgord emerges to place a straight razor on my neck, I'll say no thanks and I'll leave. If I'm working at an industrial workplace and Evan Balgord tries to sneak up behind me and shove me into dangerous equipment, I'll definitely report him to human resources. If I'm kidnapped and sent to an underground martial arts tournament where those who don't fight are killed and Evan Balgord is my opponent set to defeat me, he will not. I will emerge. If Jeremy McKenzie is trying to throw the one ring into Mount Doom to defeat anti-hate once and for all, and I'm needed to create a distraction, I will confront Evan Balgord at the Black Gate. This one is, <laughs> see if you can get this reference. Pretty on the nose. If I'm involved in a hit and run, but the victim survives, and it's Evan Balgord seeking mortal revenge with a large hook, because he knows what I did the previous summer, I will outlast him. I will survive. Uh, that's not an admission that I've ever engaged in a and run that's never happened but if it were to and his response was disproportionate i'll outlast i'll survive if i see evan balgord unconscious and dying in the street and in the process of performing first aid on him i notice a do not resuscitate bracelet i will let him die okay let's talk about the difference between a risk and a threat you could say that the risk is like the exploitation of a vulnerability or the likelihood of some kind of damage. If you're crossing the street, what is the risk of crossing the street? Okay, well, if you're crossing the highway, there's a difference in the risk there. The likelihood that you are going to get injured, the potential for damage associated with that action is different. If I were going to fight and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a tiger, what are the risks associated with that? Well, pretty high, <laughs> pretty freaking high. Uh, do I have a sword? <laughs> do I have a gun and I see the tiger before it sees me? What's the, what are the circumstances there? But let's say that, uh, you know, you're in a dark alley, you're in a dark alley with nothing on you, but just your fists and uh, you're going toe to toe with the tiger. What are the risks associated with that? Well, almost hundred percent of the time you're, you're going to die, right? To expect otherwise would be some sort of Samson-esque miracle. Now that's the risk. The threat would be, well, are there any tigers actually here stalking me? How imminent is, how imminent is the confrontation of those risks? Is there any sort of active component to the risk forcing itself on me? The risk of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a tiger, that remains consistent. But the context, are you in the jungle? Now we're talking about threat, the threat of that risk being realized. Or am I in North America? Not a lot of tigers wandering around here. I don't exactly have to worry about that when I go for a walk. Now, 
if a tiger just escaped from the zoo nearby, then now the risk has remained the same, but the threat has increased from the regular baseline. How hungry is the tiger? How domesticated is it? Those sort of things. A lot of this spawned from a conversation I was having with someone on Twitter, this disagreement. Uh, I, of course, won, and they, of course, blocked me, which is usually the case. But I want you guys to consider this scenario, okay? And all of this has to do with also the manipulation of the word safe. This is how people get tricked into accepting that a thing is safe. If I were to bake a batch of cookies and one out of five of those cookies was lethally dangerous for whatever reason, one out of five of those cookies killed someone. If five people ate those cookies, the statistical likelihood is that one person has died, right? Now let's say that I make a second batch of cookies. With that batch of cookies, one out of 10 of them is lethal. They're half as lethal as the first batch. However, 20 people eat those cookies. Well, the statistical likelihood from that would be that two people died from that. Which batch of cookies is safer? That's my question for you guys. First batch causes the death of one person. Second batch causes the death of two people. Which is safer? So Popcorn says that the second batch is safer. One in 10 is better than one in five. Now that is correct. That is, that's correct in the sense that it is a safer ratio. If you're going to eat one of those cookies, you're probably going to want one from the second batch. However, the second batch has killed more people. <laughs> Renegade says it's a safe and effective batch. Well, that's exactly what we're getting into here, right? If you were to require everyone to eat some of these cookies, not eating the cookies is safer at all. Or let's, this is going to make the analogy a little bit more complicated, but let's go back to the tiger thing, right? Let's say that um, your risk is the likelihood of, of death or destruction, death or damage when going toe to toe with a tiger. The threat is your likelihood of having to encounter a tiger. And let's say that out here, you don't have to worry about tigers, but uh, there is this technology that has been created. Let's say that it's like this energy pulse that goes on your wrist, some sort of wrist mounted device that shoots out an energy pulse. It gives you like a wave, a shield, and it repels tigers when they come near you. That's a pretty great technology. It's shown that it works against tigers. Sometimes it actually kills its user, but hey, that's super unlikely. You know, it's kind of like heavy and cumbersome. It might be a drag on you for the rest of your life, but for, you know, in order for your safety, you are legally required to wear this device at all times in order to be able to enter a restaurant, in order to be able to work a job or travel across the States. Uh, it might shave five years off of your life. We don't know. Let's throw a random number out there. Let's say that uh, in, say, a couple of years after the wrist mounted device was implemented, one in 73 people died. But, you know, that was probably totally unrelated. Totally unrelated. We can't prove any of that. So no one's really getting statistics on it. But um, you could definitely say that that device is safer than going toe-to-toe -to -toe with, to -to -toe with a tiger. The next kind of question for us to ask too is, well, what are the contexts that people are having to actually engage with the threat? If the statistic is that a certain number of people have been mauled and attacked by tigers, are we talking about a child walking to school? Are we talking about a zookeeper who made the decision to work with tigers? Was there an element of their negligence? Like what, just what are the circumstances? They're not all entirely equal. This is going to seem like a bit of a callous expansion of this allegory, but let's say that the tiger, it only had a taste for very obese people and elderly flesh. And I'm talking people who are past the age, past the average lifespan. Would it still be appropriate to force all of the children to wear this wrist mounted device that we don't know what the effects are going to be when they get old? I think back a lot of times to the nuclear reactor in Fukushima. Once it started to melt down, there were all these efforts in order to mitigate the spread of this radioactive material. Many of the people who worked at the factory who were retired, they're elderly people, they had retired. They started showing up to the reactor to relieve the younger men 
because they knew that they were going to get exposed to radioactive material that was going to shorten their lifespan. But their reasoning was that they had already lived their lives. They were already close to death anyway, closer to death. And so it was like their, their duty to this society to preserve the lives of the people who still had plenty of life to live. Just like incredible sacrifice. And again, you could argue that we did the opposite. That was behind the mantra of save grandma. Expose children to um, unknown risks because there aren't long-term studies because grandma, right? I also noticed this with safe injection sites. So I was involved with the organization that brought the first first safe injection site into North America. When the Supreme Court of Canada was deciding on whether or not the safe injection site was going to be legal, my bosses took me from where I was working and asked me to go to the safe injection site for all of the cameras, for the big shot that goes in the news where everyone's like happy that the, that the uh, verdict went through approving it. And I remember being so conflicted at the time. I was like, what? Like, no one voted for any of this. They're just... <laughs> it's, it was like, I, I remember looking around and seeing some of my coworkers crying because they were so ecstatic. They were so happy. I was just so confused. I was like, I, I don't think this is a good thing though. <laughs> but the, the logic there is that what the data is saying, the data is saying that safe injection sites, they reduce the spread of disease. They reduce overdoses because they get all these statistics saying that, hey, we, we resuscitated X number of people. It used to just be that room. And within that room where you could carry those drugs, there would be actual nurses that would, um, they would assist. They couldn't actually inject the drugs, but they could make sure that you were, they could inform you on how to do it in a safe enough way. They would provide clean materials so that you're not sharing needles and, you know, clearing a rig with puddle water or anything like that. Um, And then if something's to occur, if a person is to overdose, there's an area where people are monitored while they're just tripping out. Um, And then if, if a medical intervention is required, there's people on hand immediately to um, administer naloxone or Narcan or whatever it is that they're doing. So people get resuscitated from their overdoses really quick in contrast to people who go off into private to use. And then when they overdose, no one finds them and they die. So these safe injection sites have resuscitated an immense number of people. There's no disputing that they've saved a lot of lives. Now the data that's not being factored in here is that they have, they've potentially made drug use so accessible that the barrier for entry is so low that now you have the risk has been lowered, but the threat has been increased because it's more palatable. It's more accessible to people. More people are using. You have a larger group of people who are now overdosing. Uh, I made the analogy to this person on Twitter. I said that, you know, when I was a teenager, there was a set of waterfalls that I used to explore and climb around on. The city later built a bridge in that area with guardrails in order to make it more accessible so more people could enjoy the waterfall. By reducing the risk, you're lowering the barrier for entry and you're allowing more people to engage with the thing. And if we're talking about like, a, if we're making a utilitarian argument that all that this is about is um, reducing the loss of life, well, at, at a certain point, despite the reduced risk, the threat has increased so much that yeah, using is safer than it used to be. However, the the threat is so vast that it's causing a greater loss of life. And more people are overdosing now than ever, you know, despite the safe injection sites. When we look at that data, yeah, we can look at the data that says that, wow, more people are being resuscitated than ever. <laughs> also, more people are dying than ever. So it's not working. And that goes back to, well, what's the context here? Like, Who is it that's being exposed to the risk? Who is the threat imminent to? Is it the people at the Fukushima reactor who are elderly people who have volunteered to replace the younger people? Is it, uh, again, other elderly people who have other comorbidities that, you know, respectfully should probably be grateful that they're still alive anyway? They've already outlived the rest of their peers or the majority of their peers. Something was going to knock them over. Is it, people who are making a personal decision to 
to engage in drug use. When I used to work in the neighborhood, I saw this girl who was, I think she was 18 years old. Yeah, she's 18 years old. She had just kind of gotten out of the foster system and stuff, super troubled. I kept thinking how easy the system made it for her, just like provided her with a place to live, provided her with safe everything, just facilitated her reckless decisions. And I thought there's no way she's going to live to be like 30, honestly. Um, She's probably, she wouldn't be 30 yet, but I saw her again. Maybe probably about a year ago or so. I was in Vancouver. I went to a Tim Hortons. It was one of those things where we both recognized each other and we both pretended we didn't. She looked like she was like 50, even though she would be younger than me. Again, if there's if there's troubled young people, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be supports. But I'm also very apprehensive about a certain type of facilitation. At a certain point, you're subsidizing people's bad decisions. When this really dawned on me was by talking to super entrenched users who lived in the neighborhood. I remember talking to this one guy and he was, he was one of those drug users who had totally outlived his peers. He was like, he was like an old drug user and all of his friends had died. He was like, it used to be really hard to be a drug user. You used to have to sacrifice everything. It was, he was like, it was so dangerous. There was so much stigma. You had to be really hardcore in order to be a drug user. And so, so few people did it. And he's like, but now they've made it so easy. (laughs) And it was his conclusion that the safe injection sites were dangerous. Yeah, most like municipal workers or something, there's usually someone around who's trained to be able to minister uh, naloxone. So it blocks your body's response to the drugs and it kind of like reverses the overdose. And... What will happen is, say someone is overdosing, they're losing consciousness, and naloxone is administered, and then that person regains consciousness and they're back. But you've also just like ruined their high. And a lot of times they're really pissed off (laughs) because they took drugs because they wanted to be high. It also can put them into withdrawal. So they then go seek out drugs again. And sometimes they overdose again immediately. Sometimes they, sometimes they do even more because they feel the pains of withdrawal that are brought on by the naloxone. But then when the naloxone wears off, they've consumed more drugs than they normally previously would. And then they're at very serious risk of overdose again. And you'll have some people who will, they'll need naloxone administered to them like multiple times over the course of a few hours because they keep you, you resuscitate them and you release them into the wild and then the same thing happens and you're back visiting the same person an hour later. That's not an uncommon story for first responders. And then, you know, people overdose and die and it's just like, yeah, obviously that was bound to happen sooner or later. Okay, uh, so we described how these distinctions between threat and risk relate to uh, injection sites, vaccinations, Uh, The next thing I want to highlight is transgenderism. You can say that reducing the stigma towards transgenderism, that that is reducing the risk of suicidality. But the other factor is the threat, the imminence of that. If you're increasing the pool, uh, the likelihood of people becoming transgender, then even if you've reduced the risk of that suicidality, you're, you're increasing the loss of life. If those Uh, if the threat becomes too great. The trans advocates, they say that they completely disagree with the idea that this is like a social phenomenon. You know, they get a parent who has three trans kids and they don't bat an eye. (laughs) And our camp, we look at it like, okay, well, that's a, a vegan cat. You know, this is, you have impressionable children that have discovered a way how to get special attention. At the end of the day, they want the approval of adults. And there are certain people who are rewarding certain things, and they've discovered that that's a way to do it. And where historically we would otherwise say that 90% of transgender people, that it would end up being a phase that they would grow out of, and in many cases they would later just go on to go gay, to turn gay. Um, But now we are beginning the process of transitioning, first socially, then through hormones, And then surgically, not always, sometimes people only do socially, you know, 
I guess there's kind of a scale to it, but the criticism that we have is that you're facilitating this in such a way that you're exposing more people to risk. And we do actually think that there's a degree of social malleability to it because our position is that children don't know better. They, they can't properly distinguish the difference between reality and imagination. So when you introduce these concepts, when you're doing role playing with them, which has been documented in some cases, kids are being given school assignments where they do that. They have to write out these report. Well, can you imagine what it would be like if instead of being a boy, you were a girl? How would you, how would you write your whatever, you know? So we're saying that, yeah, there's, there's a social component into this. That's why we're describing these people as groomers. We're saying that you are grooming them into this behavior. And they don't know better because we don't think that they can consent. We, we don't believe that they, we don't believe that they can consent to life altering decisions about their sexuality. They need to be guided by adults and by and large, parents have a more healthy vested interest in their children's development and actual safety than the government. Yep, there are some bad parents. There are some bad parents that abuse their kids and it's appropriate for society more broadly and the government to go in there and intervene and, you know, remove the kids from those environments. Those are very extreme, extreme circumstances. Those are like life-threatening circumstances. Um, the child threatening their own life, that's not the same thing. Not affirming the child, not using their preferred pronouns, that's not the same thing. But the state is involving itself on these ideological lines and there are schools that are, they'll have secret conversations with children without the parent's knowledge or consent. That's inappropriate. I equate that to the government workers have now become the creepy pervert at the park who insists on talking to children about sex. And maybe the kid doesn't know better and they engage with the conversation. The parents have a responsibility in saying, Ah, uh, hey, get out of here, you creep. And that's what the parents are doing. That's what all these protests are about. And the fact that it's the government who is being the creepy pervert at the park, that doesn't make this any better. The threat has increased in terms of the amount of exposure, even if the risk of suicidality has decreased. All we have to end up doing is looking at the, st at the statistics. Are more people dying overall? Well, the government just offers made now. And the other question is, well, how are they even processing the people who kind of come out on the other side? People with trans regret, you know, adverse reactions. Conveniently, they don't track a lot of those things. So the, the accurate statistics are never really measured. So if you think about it, this whole thing that you've been talking about, harm reduction, it's a little bit like some, they're telling you, no, this is like the trolley problem, right? Because we're basically, you know, Numbers, dude. We're just uh, reducing the amount of people that uh, um, uh, overdose, right? Well, and then they end up not even satisfying that. It's like, mm -hmm. even if even if we're arguing from a utilitarian framework, they're still undermining their own goals. They pretend that they want to save life, but they also promote mm -hmm. depopulation. So right. they're just fundamentally being dishonest anyway. Okay, let's um, kind of refresh this whole hatepedia thing here. Um, I haven't added any additional definitions, but I did look at, there was a decent amount of traction in the comment section. Yeah. A lot of people were giving recommendations of words that they would like to find. And if I can make any requests from people who are going to comment, um, what is going to require the most development is not just the phrases, but the definitions of those phrases. So please feel free to define these things too. give your own perspectives when it comes to that. There were the ones that you and I talked about last time, like safe. And yeah, effective. you had a bunch of them. Yeah, I had a bunch of them already. Yeah. Uh, here were some that were added that I think are pretty clever. So obviously medical assistance and dying um, military style or assault as prefixes. You know, like military style rifle. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what does that mean? Oh, it's it's painted black. It's not wood. Okay, the, these are lists that I drew from the comment section. Yeah, some of these really have to deal with hating the West uh, and hating and basically introducing all sorts of auto flagellation. Popcorn says cultural cultural appropriation, the demonization of appreciation 
of distinct cultures and the exchange of different information and values. How is cultural appropriation used is to attack the expression of people, is to attack, like you ought not to do something about Japanese culture or uh, whatever culture. But, but if you do an expression of your culture, then it's a uh, white power, uh, racism, bullshit. So it's like landmarks that you ought not to cross. For a wage gap, I have an effort to prove the stereotype that women can't do math correct. Renegade says, boss babe, a woman who has been convinced by feminism to give up traditional female roles and take up male roles. That's pretty good. Regression, the assumption that all tradition is bad, that there's no timeless wisdom. Oh, and I, I saw this one uh, uh, the other day. No one was ever happy, you know? That's very good, yeah. <laughs> They're always trying to sell the notion that no one was ever happy. Only now. Only yeah. Yep. Your great grandfather was fighting off polio while he was beating your great grandmother <laughs> with a stick, you know? Yes, yes. She was a slave. They actually didn't cooperate, you know? She didn't work for a company. She had children. Yes. So therefore, her life sucked. Think about the amount of, like, think about the care that us. Uh, as people have to put into uh, safekeeping archives and books and texts and things like that. But now all of that apparatus and all that effort is applied into passing to the next generation a bunch of poison. It's really corrupting. There would come some point that maybe, you know, if you talk about the Library of Alexandria, you would, you would even say, no, no, let, let's burn it all down and start over. <laughs> so this is about like you, I, I'm going to give you a X, but I'm going to force you to accept it that it's actually Y. And you will be, are going to value it as Y, even though mm -hmm. I know it's X, you know it's X, mm -hmm. but that's our agreement. That, uh, right. For minority, I have... Um, when the majority of the global population attempt to frame themselves as vulnerable in European countries. So, so actually tyranny them. of the minority and yes. subversion of, de of democracy. I also want to go after the idea that there are even minorities at all. It's like contextually, sure, within the country, they're a minority, but on the global scale, they're definitely a majority. I created a visual a while ago kind of explaining, okay, I have the quote. When I'm weaker than you, I ask for freedom because that is according to your principles. When I'm stronger than you, I take away your freedom because that is according to my principles. And then right. this is you not having a say is whenever you bump into the majority, um, you don't get what you want because of the will of people, because of democracy, so be a good citizen, right? Mm -hmm. But then if it's reversed and you bump into a minority, you still don't get what you want because uh, you shouldn't be intolerant of minorities um what they're doing doesn't work because you don't accept them enough either way whether you're up against a minority or a majority group you still don't get what you want abortion is health care so here you'd have to uh, expose that usually though the word health care right is something to safeguard your life to give you health and here it's being used to basically uh promote uh infanticide what about like discover yourself or find yourself? Discovering yourself is basically an invitation to spoiling your youth. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly and what And finding it is. yourself in your 30s without a family. Okay. Abortion as healthcare, I would say, is the promotion, uh, uh, promoting the view that babies are parasites. Okay, thanks for your contributions as always. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Take care. He's a smart guy. Okay, yeah, this concludes our live stream today. Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll see you next time. Also, Second Nations and stuff. Sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. If you sign up for Raid Shadow Legends and put my code in, you'll get a secret character who's an anime wa waifu. She's got big boobs and her armor doesn't really work, but she's got excellent attack skills. Raid Shadow Legends!